uh, as we get started this morning, I want to talk about our eyes. I want to talk about the condition of our eyes. Simply asking the question, how are your eyes? And uh, looking in a moment at Matthew 13. You know, recently, my family and I went to the eye doctor, the optometrist, and and uh, just to get a, a checkup and a, take a look at how our peepers are doing and to see how how we're uh, how our eye health is and so on. And that's a good thing to do from time to time. It's uh, uh, got got to the point with me where I wear contacts that I uh, was running low on contacts and. As I'm not getting any younger, uh, none of us are, I realize that problems can arise, and the eye doctor sometimes is the first line of defense. Sometimes they can see things that uh, will cue them in to uh, something that might be lurking underneath health-wise. We also need to th be thinking of our eyes as, it, as they pertain to our spiritual life. We need to think about uh, of course, what we put in through our eyes, we also need to uh, think about how we use our eyes. Let's look at Matthew 13, starting at verse 13 to begin. Matthew 13, starting at verse 13 says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now we should be you know, in, in, the, in the account there. In Matthew, Jesus is, is uh, standing in a boat as I understand it and, and preaching to a multitude on the shore. And uh, we, we also, uh, likewise, we have the scriptures. And we are fortunate, we are fortunate to have the scriptures to be able to look and to see those things that the Lord would have us, would have us to, uh, to understand in our daily lives. We need to be thankful for, first of all, our eyesight, going back to just our the physical gift of being able to see. Uh, eyesight is a wonderful gift, and we need to appreciate it if we have it. There are some that, that struggle with a lack of that physical vision, some that are stricken with blindness at some point in their lives. Maybe that's lurking on the, in the future for one, of, one, one or more of us. It's important to keep that into perspective and be thankful for our eyesight. And while we can and while we have it, we, of course, should use it and look into the Scriptures and make sure that we understand those things that can be clearly seen in the Scriptures. Make sure that we are actually seeing and comprehending it, hearing it. The same thing goes with our, with our ears. Have you ever stopped to appreciate the intricate design of the eye? Uh, as, a, as a slight aside here, if you just... Next time you're at the eye doctor's office, look for the diagram of the eye. Or get onto Google and look up the diagram of the human eye. And look at the intricate design of it. Look at the way that it's all put together and all of the parts work together to form the to have the ability to form images in your mind, in your mind's eye. It's awe-inspiring. It's Unbelievable, the intricacy there. Just looking at that creation of God should show us some of it. It, should, it shows his handiwork. It should, it should bolster our faith by looking at that and understanding this didn't just happen 
by chance, as the world would have us to believe. The intricate design of the eye, and we could go further and further with, with uh, the way that our bodies are, are made. It's a wonderful thing to look at the handiwork of God. Looking about us again in nature, we can also see those things. But going back to our vision, 87% of our daily impressions come from our sight. You know, the, the way we interact with the world, most of that is going to be visually. <clears throat> you know, there are, you know, we, we, we touch certain things and hear certain things, but, but from the time we wake up in the morning, most likely if you have your sight, you are going to spend most of your day taking things in with the eye. And uh, that... That's a, that's a wonderful, beautiful thing, but it can also be something that damages us if we aren't careful about what we put in those eyes. It's how most of us take in the world. There are numerous references to the eyes in, scriptures, in the scriptures. And primarily, when you see something listed and talked about several times in the scriptures, we can assume that that's an important thing. We can assume that the Lord wants us to pay attention to those things. We often go, again, to the eye doctor for those exams, as we mentioned a moment ago. But now we want to have a spiritual eye exam, so to speak. The scriptures tell of some eye conditions that we should watch for. So let's take a look at some of those eye conditions. One of the things that we find mentioned in the scriptures are those that are spiritually blind. You can have spiritually blind eyes. But, you know, we just talked about a moment ago that physical blindness is something that some struggle with. And you could be born with it and you can't, you can't avoid that. You could have a medical issue that is beyond your control and you might not be able to avoid the... Uh, eventual blindness that may come to some of us as we as we age but unlike those types of physical blindness spiritual blindness can absolutely be avoided we don't have to be spiritually blind if we if we put our minds to it our hearts to it and we understand what the will of the lord is lord is we don't have to be spiritually blind we can avoid that as we read a moment ago in Matthew 13, we were reminded of the statement in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, 9 says, He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. <clears throat> on looking, but do not understand. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Uh, as we look around us in the world today, we, we might see those people that, that, uh, that are hearing the noise but aren't really registering, or they're seeing what's happening in front of them but are not understanding those things. Maybe sometimes you've, you've had a Bible study with, with a friend of yours, uh, with an acquaintance, and you know that the lights are on, you know that there's some hearing of the sounds coming out of your mouth taking place, but you understand that there's not much understanding taking place because of how the conversation is going. And that's to be expected. You know, the scriptures are something that it takes time to take them in. It takes time to digest them. We have to put the time in to study, to, to come to those understandings. We'll never understand by hearing it even, you know, just once a week. As we come together here on the first day of the week, if this is all, the end all be all of our our spiritual thoughts for the week, of our study of the scriptures for the week, it's going to take us a very long time to come to those understandings. And in fact, uh, uh, it'll put us in a very dangerous place if that's all the time that we devote to understanding the will of the Lord. It's important that we think about our spiritual eyes. Some of Christ's earthly contemporaries didn't perceive him or his kingdom and mission. And we understand from John 1, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Understanding uh, from previous study that, that the, the people that were the, Jew, the Jews, the, the nation of Israel, 
uh, they, they did not understand who he was. They, they couldn't see him, and he was right in front of their face. And often maybe we think back and look at that and look at that historical account and say, well, we would have certainly done better than that. We like to think better of ourselves, but not so, not so fast. If we look around us in the world today, uh, and maybe, maybe in your own life, maybe at a time in your life when you had no use for spiritual things in your life, and you couldn't see the will of the Lord right in front of you. How many people have one of these in their home? Probably most people, at least in this country here today, have a copy of the scriptures. But <clears throat> as I was reminded, and I've said this many times, those of you that are here uh, regularly, it sound like a broken record, but reminding of the, of the reminding myself of the time where we were at the booth at the Medina County Fair and, and uh, getting to know the, the, the area and passing out invitations to come to services. And the one person came up to me and as I, I asked her if she needed a Bible and, and uh, if she was interested, we had Bibles to give out. And, and I uh, asked her if she needed one and she said, oh no, I have a Bible. And she reminded me that it was in her cedar chest and it had been there for many years. She said the year, don't remember what year that was, but it was a long time ago, before my time. And she said, I know exactly where it is. And, well, that's good that she knows where it is, but it obviously hasn't been cracked open in all those years. It's safe. Pages are safe. The cover is probably perfect. And uh, not, not been opened in many, many years. And that's a dangerous thing. That's spiritually blind. Uh, having having the will of the Lord, the word right in front of you and not not being able to understand it, not paying any attention to it. Spiritually blinded can also mean that we're wrapped up in the traditions of men. Now, how many times have we heard families say or people say, well, you know, those of us in, in my family, we're we're Lutherans. Those of us in my family, we're Methodist, and that's the that was the case with my family growing up, uh, and maybe I've mentioned it before, but my family became to be called Methodists amongst themselves because that was the vehicle, the van that pulled up in front of my grandparents' house when my mom and aunt and uncle were growing up. That's the one that pulled up in front and said, "Hey, do you want to go to do you want to go to church?" And Grandma brushed the kids out the door and said, "Church will be good for you." And put them on the van, and that by by that by that action, that that is how many of my family members became to know themselves as 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 Methodists, not because they looked into the scriptures, and unfortunately, still to this day, many refuse to look into the scriptures to see what things are true and see what the will of the Lord is. We can be spiritually blinded by those traditions. You know, there are. Uh, many traditions that take place even, you know, in our popular culture that have their roots in some kind of, of uh, man-made uh, tradition, even, even religious traditions. You know, coming, coming up here to the end of the year, we'll, uh, undoubtedly the world will take part in, in, uh, in some celebration of, spirit, of uh, uh, man-made traditions. We need to be sure that we aren't spiritually blinded, that our eyes are not spiritually blind. We need to be vigilant. We need to make sure that as much as is in us, we don't succumb to spiritual blindness. And we have that good way to avoid it by looking into the scriptures. Uh, it, it, the, the, the scriptures are able, as we've mentioned many times before, they are able to save our soul if we only look into them. We can also have unfocused eyes. Now, sometimes priorities get in the way. Priorities can become blurry. We make the wrong priorities and they get in the way. Focusing too much on the temporal things in life. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, just like the person who puts their Bible away in the, in the cedar chest and never lays eyes on it, you know, 
and focuses only on those things that they can gain in this earthly world. Uh, we, we need to be sure that our eyes are focused on the right things. We need to make sure that our eyes are focused on <clears throat> the will of the Lord. Now, matters of faith and opinion sometimes can blend together. You know, we can usurp the authority of Christ if we're not careful. Uh, again, often mentioning Matthew 28, 18, bringing to your, your memory the fact that Christ has all authority. He's been given all authority, and we don't have any. It is not up to us to order the steps of our life. And we need to look into the scriptures, and of course we need to make judgments. Of course we need to you know, judge a situation and say, I, I understand that this is not a good place for me to go. I'm going to make the, the step over here and stay in line with the will of the Lord. We need to make those judgments, but we always need to have the idea in the back of our mind, maybe in the front of our mind, that Christ has all authority, and we can't change those things that we see in the Scriptures, however much we'd like to, however much we think it would be better. You know, we look around us in the religious world today, and so many people's eyes are unfocused on the truth of the Word, and they don't believe that the word is able to, to save souls, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. So what do they do? They add things to the mix. And they say, well, we're never going to get people to come in the door unless we have something here for them. So let's have a cookout in the front yard and get people to come in. Let's build a, a basketball court so that the neighborhood children can come over and we can preach to them. You know, those, those, those ideas, well-meaning as they may be, show a lack of focus on the scriptures, a lack of faith in the Lord's ability to save a soul by his word, which he sent. And uh, we need to be sure that we have our eyes focused properly. Properly focused eyes concentrate on things above. As we understand from Colossians 3, verse 2, it says, Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. We need to look for that house not made with hands. In 2 Corinthians 5 there, verse 1, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that is better than anything that we can put together in our mind or with our hands here on this earth. All of these things that we work so hard for in our daily lives, the, the sweat of our brow, the things that we seek after and desire physically in this life, they, they, they don't mean anything in, in, in comparison to that house not made with hands that we need to focus on. If we have... Uh, unfocused eyes, we're not able to see afar off. We're not able to see those dangers that come at us in life. Now, Second Peter 1 at verse 9 says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Now think of climbing a ladder. If you're climbing a ladder... And let's say you're trying to uh, see something that is up on the, the roof of your house. In, in my particular case of my house, we get, we get wasps' nests, nests hornets', hornets nests that uh, almost every year somewhere, in our, somewhere in, our, in our yard. So let's say that we have one of those starting, and I can't really see it up at the top of the house there at the peak of the roof. So, so uh, let's pretend that I would climb the ladder and look. I wouldn't. But uh, if I were to climb that ladder and look to see what that spot was up there, I might not be able to see it from down below, but the closer I got, the further I went up and raised my ability to see a little bit better as I got closer, I would be able to see more clearly. And the same way, as we climb the ladder in our lives, as we look into the scriptures and climb a little bit higher in our understanding and put a little bit more scripture into our minds, into our hearts. You know, and there's another 
another thought, thinking of losing your vision. We don't know when that might happen. You've got your eyes now, the ability to study and to read. How much more difficult would it be without your physical vision? How much more difficult of a time would you have putting the word of God in your heart? If you didn't have your eyes. So if you have your eyes, be thankful for that. Use them for what God intended them to do. Learn about his will. Now, the closer you are, the better you get to see it. Going back to that, that little story about the, about the ladder. You know, but it goes both ways. You know, sometimes we take our lives and we climb a little bit closer to things that we shouldn't be getting close to. Sometimes it's very difficult to go back. Sometimes it's very it's difficult for me to go down a ladder, more, more so than going up a ladder. I find it more difficult. You know, sometimes we, we get ourselves up that ladder in the wrong direction, and, and it's difficult to turn around. We need to be careful of that. We need to be careful that our eyes are focused, that they are not unfocused as we go through, life, go through our lives. Another eye condition is an evil eye that we can that we can uh, talk about from the scriptures an evil eye looks with anticipation hoping to see the fault in others as we we, we can think of maybe you've heard this uh, analogy before but think of a person looking out of their maybe your your typical nosy neighbor there was a, uh, a, a sitcom years ago uh, that that featured a nosy neighbor, I forget her name was Mrs. Kravitz or something like that. Yeah, you got, that's the one. And you can see her looking out the window and looking at the neighbor's laundry and saying, oh, their laundry looks horrible. Look at all those spots. She just can't do laundry at all. And you, you, you can envision, envision that. Come to realize that the spots are on her window. They're not on the neighbor's laundry, but they're on her window. And many times as we look out into the world, we, we might do that. We are human beings, and sometimes we might get caught up in that. And we're anticipating, hoping to see some fault in others. Sometimes we do that, human beings do that to build themselves up, to make themselves feel better. Oh yeah, well I did that, but I'm not as bad as that one over there. And so we look through the window and try to find those faults in others. Come to realize that the faults that we're seeing... They're in our own window. It's on our side of the fence. Matthew 7, starting at verse 1, says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, and these are, of course, wise words for us to take in. And understanding that you know, we are allowed to make judgments about situations in our lives. We make those judgments with the understanding of the will of the Lord. Understanding that we're not judging someone's eternal destination that is not our end of the stick we need to make sure that we're not doing that that we aren't looking with anticipation hoping to see fault hoping to see failure in those around us that's not how we want to feel good about ourselves we want we want to feel good because we understand that we have a focused spiritual eye a focused eye on things above that we don't allow the evil eye, which is very tempting. It's very easy to fall into that trap. Every one of us, I'm sure, can say that we've, we've had situations where we've been just like Mrs. Kravitz, and we've, we've been looking, we've been lurking and looking for something to complain about, something that we can point the finger at from our own insecurity. And Jesus also spoke of an evil eye. Looking at Matthew 6, just a, a chapter back if you're following along in your Bibles. Matthew 6, starting at verse 22. 
The light of the body is the eye. If, there, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And I switched to the King James on you there uh, because it used the term evil eye. Did you keep things parallel in my, in my points? But if you look at your, at your uh, if you're not using the King James, most likely it says that your eye would be bad. It is speaking of a bad eye, uh, an eye in bad condition. And looking at the lexicon, that's probably a better way to put it, having a bad eye. Understanding, though, I have underlined there in Matthew 6 and verse 22, if therefore thine eye be single. We need to be focused, singly focused on those things of, of the Lord. If we are focused on the things of the Lord, our whole body shall be full of light. Understanding, and we've uh, no doubt heard this statement there in verse 24, no man can serve two masters. Can't serve God and mammon. It's impossible to do so. Many people try to ride that fence. They want to have one foot here and one foot there. There's just the, the things of the world are so enticing, they don't want to give them up. So I can still do that Monday through Friday, maybe except Thursday when I go to Bible study possibly. But the rest of the week I can, I can, I can live my old life a little bit and then come together and put on a good show on Sunday. And that's uh, something that we, of course, we, we don't want to find ourselves doing. We can't, we know from the scriptures, Christ himself said, you can't, you can't serve two masters. It'll be, it, it'll be a dangerous place that you put yourself in if you do that. We can't have that evil eye. We also need to be careful of a lustful eye. It's increasingly common in the world today, I, it's probably always been uh, very common. You know, many uh, years ago, Angela and I traveled in college, uh, and we went to Italy, and we happened to be able to go to Pompeii. And one of the things that stuck with me from my very quick tour of Pompeii was that they took us past the bathhouses and so on, where things that are unseemly and should not be spoken of take place. Yeah, and you could see the murals on the walls. And it was very clear that even back then, in what was that, 79 AD, when, when that, uh, if, I, if my memory is correct, when that uh, volcano erupted and took that city out, even back then it was very clear from the artwork and from the, from the remnants of that culture that lust, a lustful eye was still was there even back then. Uh, it's no different here today. In fact, now the murals showing our culture are lining the highways, uh, those billboards, the television commercials that we see, even the radio commercials that we see uh, can even paint us a picture that takes us down that path. We need to be careful not to have that lustful eye. It's all too common. Uh, Peter said, some have eyes full of adultery in 2 Peter 2, starting at verse 13. Suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. It's a dangerous place to be, and we're in the middle of it every day when we walk through our lives. We need to be careful that we are not those unstable souls. We don't want to be easily enticed by those things. The way to be stable is to look into the scriptures, to avoid that lustful eye. You know, as, as, a, as a man in society today, uh, you just have to turn your head. Uh, sometimes, you know, people will, I, I, you know, I used to 
teach driving school. And, and I, people would get in the car with me, young ladies would get in the car, and I was shocked at the things that they were wearing out of the house. Shocked at the things that their parents would let them wear out of the house. And uh, all adding to that lustful eye of society today. And we need to be careful. We need to guard our eyes. We need to turn our head. We need to do what we can. As time goes on, the more I think, I think that nowadays if I had had to be teaching driver's ed, I'd put an opaque wall up between me and the, and the driver with just a little hole to reach the steering wheel or something. I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's unreal sometimes the level at which we see things like this going on in, in society. And it's difficult. It's difficult. You know, with these, uh, uh, these ways inside of us, you know, the, these urges are put there by God, but we need to keep them under control. As Paul said, I buffet my body. We need to beat ourselves into submission that we don't fall in to those traps. We need to look at the despicable actions by those in the news. We can see the lustful eyes. We don't need to go into details, but just turn on the news lately and you'll, you'll hear of all sorts of things that, that line up with this idea of a lustful eye. Hollywood, even children's programming promotes a lustful eye. You can't even trust the, uh, the children's programming that comes from the place down south with, mouth, with, with mouse ears on their hats. You can't even trust those things. But the world thinks that's good, wholesome entertainment. But we understand as we look at it through the filter of the scriptures that it promotes a lustful eye many times. Current fashion feeds the lust as well. You know, as I was preparing for this lesson, I I saw an old uh, lesson by a, a, a preacher from years ago, and he had said, Old Mother Hubbard is bare instead of her cupboard. You know, it's, uh, we remember that nursery rhyme, but nowadays it just seems like that's the way things are going. It's, uh, it's an unfortunate thing. Our dress should be modest and orderly. 1 Timothy 2 of verse 9 says, Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments. We need to be careful about those things we put on our bodies to uh, accentuate our bodies. You know, it's, it's, uh, of course, we need clothing, and of course, we want to uh, look good to some degree, uh, but we need to be careful that we're not putting on, putting on errors, so to speak. Our dress should be modest and orderly. We need to fight for that high standard, God's standard. It's a, it's a scratch, it's a scratching our way through kind of fight through life, to fight for that high standard that God has set. Christ warned against this lustful eye, Matthew 5 Verse 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's hard work to do this. It's hard work to guard against these things. It takes, just like any good soldier preparing for battle, you have to train. You have to prepare for that battle. We have to do the hard work and ask ourselves if we have a lustful eye. And if we do, we need to change from it. We need to be sure that we don't fall into those same traps, that the same can't be written about us. You know, thinking back to the examples we have in the scriptures, some other examples, we have Eve that fell victim to that lustful eye for that forbidden fruit. Think of David and how he fell to that lustful eye with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11. And then Simon, falling to that power of the Holy Spirit that he lusted after in Acts 8. We don't want to fall into those traps. Now these are people that, uh, you know, David, David was a, a, a person who sought after the Lord many times in his life, who was a useful servant to the Lord, but, but fell there in that particular situation. We need to be careful that we don't fall into those same traps. Uh, a lustful eye is a dangerous thing. 
We need to make sure that we don't have a deliberately closed eye either. You know, Jesus wept over the closed eyes of Jerusalem. Luke 19, starting at verse 41, says, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. We don't want Jesus to look upon us and weep because we've had our eyes closed, because we've, because we've refused those good things in the scriptures. Sadly, it's still happening today. You know, some just won't bother. Some just won't bother to take the time. You know, in, in Acts 17.11, those in Thessalonica, they didn't bother. In Acts 17.11, we read, Now these, and this is speaking of the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. You know, they, uh, the Bereans opened, their, script, opened their, their Bibles and looked. They searched the scriptures to see if they were on the right path. But the Thess those in Thessalonica, they, they just didn't bother. They just didn't bother to carve out the time in their day. Now, sometimes even Christians close their eyes. If your eyes are closed, wake up. Don't let it progress to being deliberate. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it's easy to fall into these traps. I've said that many times. But if we put our mind to it, and especially if we stick together as those in the, in the household of faith, you know, we can build each other up. We can share these burdens with one another and we can come through victorious. We have that promise in Christ. Are our eyes open to the example, to our example in the community? Do we think about what people are looking at us and, and saying about our example? Do they see us dutifully coming into the building here on Sunday morning, but do they also see us across town doing things that that would not be worthy of alignment with the name of Christ? Are our eyes open to that example? We don't want to have deliberately closed eyes to our own example in the world. Are our eyes closed to the fatherless? James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows into their, in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You know, we need to look around us and have our eyes open to see those that need assistance and those that need help. You know, one of the, if you drive through, especially some of the larger cities, Akron, I was in Akron yesterday, come up to the top of the freeway ramp to get off of the freeway, and there's a man with a sign there begging for money. And, and, and it's, that's a difficult situation because those thoughts go through, go through your mind. Uh, you know, do you want to give that person Money because you think that, you know, what are they going to do with it? We, we, we go, through those, go through those thoughts. But I can tell you that one, one good sister uh, that I know of stopped one day and got out and went over and talked to one of these people. And it and, uh, wasn't right away, but in some time he ended up coming to services of the church. And to this day, he's a faithful Christian. It's a wonderful example, one that, that I think of, and it builds me up and gives me some, some strength. Yeah, but it's hard to get out of the car and go walk up to someone like that. It's hard to have that open eye. It's easy to close your eyes, lock the doors, and keep on moving. It's a hard thing to do. You know, we, we need to be thinking of those around us that need, that need to know this truth that we have. Do we think of the unsaved again? Matthew 28, 18, 18 through 20. We, we, we remember that Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And remember, that doesn't leave us any. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And they taught, they taught those they came into contact with. And here we are all these years later, the same job is in front of us teaching those to observe all those things that were commanded back then. 
We have that job too, to go out and teach and to go out and uh, help to further the kingdom of God on this earth. We need to remember John 4, verse 35. It says, Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. There are people out there that are seeking. There are people out there that are ready to hear. They may be few and far between, but we need to do our job. We can't deliberately close our eyes on that job. We need to do those hard things. We need to face those fears that we may have of doing that, the stage fright, so to speak, that we may have of, of talking to others. Uh, it can get better in time. I remember the first time I got up to, to uh, in, in a men's training class at the congregation that we worshiped with years ago, and I got up in front of the, and I was used to teaching children, used to teaching driver's head, standing up in front of a group of people. But I got up in front of the people that were out there that I knew loved me and were on my side, and I was scared. My knees were knocking, and I was shaking, and I was sweating. And uh, it gets better in time. You just have to get out there and do it. And we have to be a support to one another so that we don't become disheartened. Don't have those deliberately closed eyes. As we close things out here today, ask yourself the question about how are your eyes? Won't you be the apple of his eye today? Psalm 17 at verse 8 says, Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. That's exactly where we want to be as well. If you haven't Put on Christ. You can do that today. The scriptures tell us that one needs to hear the word. Romans 10, 17 reminds us that that's where faith comes from. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to believe that Christ is who he says he is. And when we do that, we understand that we need to change our ways. We need to repent and turn away from those old, that old man of sin. We need to have a new purpose in our lives. Not purposing to fulfill our own desires, but purposing to do the will of the Father just as Christ did as he was on this earth. We need to confess Christ before men, not being ashamed of, of him. We need to be baptized, immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins, because he said so. That's where we contact the blood of Christ, where we come out of the waters of baptism a new creation, raised to walk in that newness of life. And then after that comes that hard part we've been alluding to all these through all these points of this lesson here today. We need to remain faithful. That's the hard part. If you haven't put on Christ and you're thinking about it, count the cost of that. Understand that that's what's in store for you, that you need to remain faithful and do those hard things and make those hard decisions the rest of your days if you hope to be in heaven after a while. If you've fallen away and you find that those be remaining faithful has become difficult and, and you've allowed things of this world, the, the, the eye conditions we've spoken of maybe today, into your life, then by all means uh, we, we stand here ready to pray with you and for you that you might be restored to faithfulness in Christ. Whatever your need may be, we ask that you don't wait another day, but be sure, be sure of your eternal salvation. If, uh, if you're subject to the invitation, please stand, or please come forward as we stand and sing. Hear the sweet voice.